Imagine a new kind of investing, a potentially life-changing way to invest that honors biblical principles, the kind of principles that you and I grew up with. Since 1994, Timothy Plan has made biblically responsible investing possible, offering mutual funds and ETFs that are filtered for biblical principles. Don't compromise your values. Invest with Timothy Plan. Ask your financial advisor or call Timothy Plan at 1-800-TIM-PLAN. Again, that's 1-800-846-7526 and discover what it means to be a biblically responsible investor. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. Mutual funds distributed by Timothy Partners, LTD, and ETFs distributed by Foresight Fund Services, LLC. As a paid testimonial, there is no guarantee of future performance, and each experience will differ. Hey there, welcome to the Memo Pod. I'm glad that you made time for us. Man, this week it was the vice presidential debate, and therefore we got to spend some time talking about it. I don't know if you watched it or not, um, but if you didn't, I'm going to tell you the things that you really needed to know and the things I'm not going to mention that you don't need to know because you don't need to know them. I know where a lot of folks are, especially Christians are right now. Um, They're either frustrated, they're nervous, they're anxious. It's one of the reasons why I've written some of the stuff that I have, uh, and it's one of the things that I'm trying to stress, that regardless of the outcome of this election, which of course we're going to say is the most important and the most consequential of our lifetime, um, for Christians, we're good. I don't know if we'll continue to live in the lap of of religious freedom. If you read the the scriptures, you have no expectation. You should have no expectation, reasonable expectation, to think that you will continue to enjoy religious freedom. You just, you, you don't. That's not the story of God's people down through the ages. We are the exception. And whereas I would love for that to continue, um, I, I'm not going to panic about it not, um, because God's people have always been cared for. And I'm confident in that. And uh, I think uh, too much anxiousness and too much panic, I think, is sometimes a sign uh, that we are, um, uh, that we've shifted our confidence and our hope too much uh, in the direction of, of worldly things and in the hands of men. Not always, but I, but I think it certainly, it certainly can be. That doesn't mean that we're not engaged. That doesn't mean we don't talk about it. That doesn't mean that as as sojourners here, as, uh, as um, what's the word, uh, strangers in a strange land, that we are uh, somehow not to comment on or not to be involved in. Um, I talked recently in a sermon about th- that there were, at the time of uh, Jesus, that there were two major political parties, in, and I think maybe I've even mentioned it on here before. You had the Herodians. Those are the ones that supported uh, King Herod and therefore Rome, because King Herod was more than fine with Rome's authority. He was fine being a vassal ruler under Rome because he was well fed. He was well taken care of. And so he was good with the Roman authorities. And so if you were Herodian, say like uh, Matthew, the tax collector was, then uh, that that's what you supported. Then on the other side, the other political party, you had the zealots. This is like Sam Adams and the boys, the revolutionaries. They wanted an overthrow of Rome. And you're sitting there saying, dude, we can't overthrow Rome. They're the mightiest military in the world. Well, that's what people said to Sam Adams. Granted, Sam came after these guys, but anyway, that was that was their position. That that this is these are God's people, and they should not be any more than they were under the thumb of Pharaoh. They should not be under the thumb of Caesar, and so we need a violent overthrow. So you had these two political parties, say like Simon the Zealot, and that's one of the things that I pointed out in a sermon. Uh, Jesus's ministry takes two people who were as far right and far left in our modern parlance, our modern lexicon. And um, he made them disciples. I think there's a great lesson there for us. That outside of Jesus, Simon the Zealot would have thought Matthew was some kind of of, uh, a traitor. And certainly Matthew would have thought that Simon the Zealot was a traitor. They would have despised each other. And yet the work for the kingdom of God trumped all of that. And then there was a third community. And this is what I was getting at a second ago. That third community, the Essenes, they settled by, uh, Qumran was their community. They settled by the, the edge of the Dead Sea. 
and they carried on Jewish monastic life there. They just kind of wanted to be left alone and they copied texts and all kinds of things. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be appreciative of the Essenes because they're the ones that copied all of those scrolls that later were found and became the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's them. That's the Essenes, the uh, the folks in, in Qumran. But I'm not suggesting to you that as believers today, we need to isolate ourselves and go settle by the, well, for me here, it would be, I guess I could say Lake Michigan. That, that would be a little bit more recognizable for some of you like in Georgia and Texas and other places who are subscribers. You wouldn't necessarily know the Wildcat Creek. If you're from here in central Indiana, then that would make sense and you would laugh at that. The rest of you have no idea. I'm not suggesting that we go and we, we set up a community around Lake Michigan or whatever lake is near you and we just carry on Christian life and keep to ourselves. No, I think we have a responsibility to be salt and light. Uh, in the memo that I sent you on Monday, and I don't know if you ever got around to watching the Matt Walsh clip, and Matt Walsh was commenting on uh, uh, Phil Vischer and Sky Jathani and Mike Erie, I believe was the other guy's name, and it was Mike Erie, the minister, who said, and this was the thing that, my, that Matt Walsh took great exception to, that you cannot follow Jesus, or the Sermon on the Mount, and fight a culture war. Well, that's a, that to me was an astounding thing to say because Phil Vischer and Sky Jathani, they are fighting a culture war. Granted, they're talking more often about social justice issues and they're talking about racial issues a lot and they're talking about immigration, but those are all cultural issues. So when they are talking about them on a daily basis, they're fighting a culture war. Now, granted, when they hear Mike Erie say that and when Mike Erie says that to them, he's speaking specifically about um, what Matt Walsh is doing and what Matt Walsh is focusing on. He's a culture warrior. Well, dude, Sky and, and, and Phil, you're doing the same thing, man. You're fighting the culture war. Just a lot of times you're on the opposite side. Uh, so anyway, Ma Matt Walsh was making the point, which I agree with, that you cannot really follow Jesus and his instruction to be salt and light and not be speaking about and talking about cultural issues. Now, here's the thing. That doesn't mean that you are speaking about them and talking about them within the confines of, of the political universe. Meaning, it doesn't mean that you are trying to export your values through the vehicle of a political party. No, a Christian could very well be saying both of the parties of man are wrong on this. And none of the laws that they're pushing for are just, because as Martin Luther King says, a just law is the one that squares with the moral law of God. And here's what the moral law of God teaches. We would be better off as a people if we all came around to embracing this. That isn't endorsing a candidate. That's not being intricately involved in the political process. Again, I'm not saying it's wrong to, I'm, I'm saying it's not wrong not to. Um, that's a confusing way of saying it. It's okay if you find yourself disenchanted with both political parties as they exist in the United States, a, a Christian can completely be in that position. Just like I believe a Christian can say, this party remains the best vehicle through which I can transmit my values. Then you get into the whole, whole debate of uh, are political channels and is the law the most effective way to, to transmit our values? That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother time. Certainly not today. Um, but anyway, so long story, and we're back around to where we started. Th the debate occurred, and I know a lot of you who are maybe feeling anxious about this, you steered clear of it. And I understand that. I really do. So let me just tell you how it went down. Uh, J.D. Vance won that debate, and it wasn't even close. I, I, and I'm not saying that because I'm trying to be uh, biased in any way, shape, or form. I thought Tim Walls did a nice job of, of he, he was composed, um, and he wasn't too, well, he was composed. He, he was nervous, but he, he didn't do anything super weird or anything like that. He had some weird faces, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the thing that I said in a video I did for Not the Bee was, this is what our, all of our debates should be. The two guys, if you saw them after the debate, they stood on the stage, their wives uh, spoke to each other, they shook hands, they spent some time talking to each other before they went down and greeted the... That's it. 
politeness, cordiality, fiercely uh, opposed on policy issues, and they talked about policy. They really did. And it was, it was great. <laughs> it was really great. Let me show you what I believe, before I get on to why I thought J.D. Vance easily was the winner of this debate, um, uh, let me show you something that I think is indicative. It's, it's a perfect example of the problem that we now have, okay? This is a clip from a guy who used to be on CNN. He was one of their primetime hosts. He was a major figure on CNN for a long time until uh, some of the people that worked for him and worked with him, he, he kind of, uh, he ran his own ship aground. Uh, a gay guy by the name of Don Lemon, uh, a gay black man named Don Lemon, who kind of had the run of the place for a while, uh, when CNN was panicked about identitarian politics and we cannot fire a gay black man. You can't do that or you're going to bring down the, the canceling hordes on you. I guess CNN realized nobody really watches our network anyway, so we might as well. But Don Lemon got himself into some trouble, so he's no longer at CNN. Uh, but Don Lemon still does, and I don't know what channel he's working with. I don't know if he's just producing his own stuff. I don't, I don't exactly know the whole story. But he has interns working for him. And he posted this clip online during the debate. Better about how the government comes. They were so obsessed with impeaching Donald Trump. They couldn't actually go. And I want to talk about this to Fisher in particular. Uh, That's the problem. This was a debate where people were not insulting one another. They weren't attacking each other or going for the jugular and going for the gotcha moment. They weren't trying to get the one-liners or, or like Kamala Harris, where she had practiced certain poses so that it could be repeated on social media and these clips. And it was none of that. And so does, so do people like Don Lemon, who is supposed to be a political commentator and a, and a political analyst um, and supposed to be... He should be the one saying, yeah, America, this is what they're supposed to be. But we now live in the United States of entertainment, and we constantly have to be entertained. One of the reasons that politics today is such an utter train wreck, one of the reasons that, that things are so unproductive in political channels is because of the TV culture that we're in, and now the social media video culture that we're in. Everybody's got to have the soundbite. And that's what they rehearse for. Um, I've talked before about how if I ever ran for office, one of the things I would want to do, and I mean high office, nobody cares if you're running for county clerk if you have a debate, nobody cares. But um, I'm not insulting anybody that ran for county clerk, just so we're clear on that. Um, but no, nobody's going to go to a debate like that. But if you're going to do that, like say running for president, if I ever ran for president of the United States, I would desperately want to campaign with my opponent. I know that's wild, but I would really, really want it. I would beg the other person. I mean, if we want to have our own separate events, that's fine, but let's set up a schedule where we travel together and we spend Lincoln Douglas style three hours on a debate stage or, or just on a stage. And we're talking with people, taking questions, we, if you have to have a moderator to kind of keep track of things, then let's agree on a singular moderator. But we're going to take questions from people and we're going to expound upon our ideas and we're going to allow each other to go back and make corrections so it's not as hostile of an environment. You get more than a minute to make your statement on what you think our foreign policy should be. Like that question that if you didn't watch it, you didn't know this. But one of the first questions was, would you support Israel striking Iran? and you're giving a, a person two minutes or one minute to answer that question? I mean, there's a lot of caveats. There's a lot of nuance to an answer like that. There's a lot of things that would have to take place that you need to set the stage for. Man, you can't do that in two minutes or one minute, but that's what we're going for. The entire setup of these debates is to, is to please people like Don Lemon, who want to be entertained. And yeah, I don't know, maybe the American people as we exist now did get bored and they turned the channel to go watch something else because they don't want to hear about plans for securing the border or they don't want to hear about um, education and, and you know ending the Department of Education and th does the federal government have a role in all of that? I, I understand there's a lot of people that would rather vote on the basis of who has the prettier signs or who has the coolest uh, social media 
uh, campaign. I, but man, that's the problem. Exactly what Don Lemon was saying. That's why we are where we are. And for all of the people that lament the rise of Donald Trump, everybody that's bothered by that, why do you think the Republican Party picked him the first time in 2016? Because he was massively entertaining in the primary debates. He owned Jeb Bush and everybody else that dared to inch closer to him and would make jokes about him. People loved it. And he's somebody that's going to fire back. And he, and he said in a debate with Hillary Clinton that she would be in jail and everybody goes nuts and loves it. It's entertaining. Man, that's not, I mean, it makes for great television, I guess, but it doesn't make for great leadership and it doesn't make for great policy. Um, I just, I don't know. To me, when I saw that Don Lemon clip, I was just sitting there saying, yeah, this is the issue. It's the issue. All right. So why do I think J.D. Vance won this debate? It's pretty simple. Mike Cosper, who I think is at Christianity Today, I think that's where he is, uh, which I know a lot of conservatives are upset with Christianity Today and all of that. But this is what Mike Cosper wrote, and I think he's spot on. He said, Vance won this one easily. He disarmed walls at the top by being gentlemanly and respectful. In other words, a pre-Trump era conservative who cares about manners and nothing like the MAGA bro that he played on podcasts for the last few years. All right. That comment notwithstanding, I agree with the premise that um, Vance disarmed Walls, that Walls expected Vance to come in like a bulldog and Vance didn't come in like a bulldog. He came in like a, like a, a gentleman. Um, yes, Walls had some really bad moments. He said some really dumb things. He said some things that I don't even want to pick on, and I know everybody gets the soundbite, but that's the whole thing. I'm even going to mention the one that he said that was a clearly, uh, he, he was speaking quickly, and he didn't notice that he even said it. He said it in passing, and nobody believes that he really did that or, or uh, believes that or anything, but we have to make a big deal out of it. No. Make a big deal out of the bad policy that he talked about. Make a bad deal or a big deal about the fact that he said he did not sign a law in his home state of Minnesota that said that babies who survive abortion don't have to receive medical care and medical treatment. He signed that law, but he sat there and said, no, that's not what it says. That's exactly what it says. You signed the law. Talk about that. Not the slip of the tongue that made for a funny moment there all at once. Um, but here's what Cosper did say, and I would agree with this. Um, the moderators came out looking the worst. Again, they tried to fact check Vance, which they weren't supposed to. I'm going to roll this clip. Before you watch this, just know that the agreement was... After the whole presidential debate debacle, when Crane, do you remember when Candy Crowley was moderating the debate between Obama and Mitt Romney? And Mitt Romney had Obama on the ropes and was sticking him to the wall, and Obama was flustered. Candy Crowley, you could almost visually see it. This was her guy. And she had to come to his defense. And so she came in as this arbiter of truth and fact check Mitt Romney and said that whatever it was, I don't even remember the issue, whatever Mitt Romney said wasn't true, that Barack Obama was actually right about that. And Barack Obama seized on that and said, well, there you go. As though she's the, and Mitt Romney, as I recall, said something, well, we'll, we'll look into that. We'll check on that. Okay, but in the debate, it stopped that moment for Mitt Romney. And ever since that time, Ever since that time, Republicans should have always, first of all, they should have never gone on any of these networks. They should have never participated with anyone from, from the, the legacy or the uh, state, I don't want to call it state-run media, but it's state-influenced media. Should have never agreed to a debate there. Uh, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Tim Walls would never agree to a debate that was moderated by Sean Hannity. Wouldn't would never agree to a debate moderated by Clay, Travis, and Buck Sexton. 
would never agree to it. But that is what Republicans are agreeing to when they go on with Nora O'Donnell and, uh, and Margaret Brennan. But so anyway, um, they uh, fact-checked Donald Trump during the debate, did not fact-check Kamala Harris, despite many falsehoods that she was saying. And so Republicans demanded, we're not going to have media acting as fact-checkers. We don't trust you, and you can't do it. And the media agreed... The hosts agreed, and then once in the debate, they attempted to do that to J.D. Vance. Vance speaks up and says, okay, hold on. The rules were you weren't going to fact check. And then, by the way, bam, right there. That's, we go back to the sound bite culture. That's what the left wanted. Now they've got this scene of a moderator setting the record straight on one of J.D.'s lies, and J.D. getting mad because... You said you weren't going to fact check me, meaning I thought I was going to be able to lie. No, 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 no. That's not what happened. You got to roll the whole clip. The fact is that J.D. Vance was on his toes. He knew his stuff, which Donald Trump never does. J.D. Vance knew, and I'm not saying that because I, oh, you're anti-Trump. No, he doesn't know. That's not what he's good at. He's an entertainer. He doesn't know. And you can see it every time he tries to debate. J.D. Vance is smart, and J.D. Vance knows the truth, and he knows how to articulate it. And so when they try to fact-check him, he then fact-checks the fact-checkers and humiliates them. Roll this. Temporary protected status. Well, Mar- 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 Nora, but, but thank you. No, Senator, we have no, no, so much to get to. Mar- Margaret, I, I think it's important the, because... We're going to turn out of the, the debate, economy. Thank Margaret, you. Margaret, the, the, the rules were that the you economy, guys weren't going to fact check. And since you're fact checking me, I think it's important to say what's actually going on. So there's an application called the CBP One app where you can go on as an illegal migrant, apply for asylum or apply for parole and be granted legal status at the wave of a Kamala Harris open border wand. That is not a person coming in, applying for a green card and waiting for 10 years. That Thank is you, the Senator. facilitation of illegal immigration, Margaret, by Thank our you, own Senator, leadership. Thank you, Senator, for describing the legal and Ka- process. And Kamala, Kamala, we and have Kamala so Harris much to get to, that Senator. Pathway. Those we laws have, so have been much... on the books since 1990. Thank you, gentlemen. Now, the the, the CBP have... one app has not been on the books. Beautiful. Beautiful. And that right there was worth the price of admission. I, This is why I love this debate more than any debate that I have watched. Uh, When George W. Bush debated Al Gore, and he kind of gave him that look when Al Gore came towards him, like, all right, Um, hilarious. But I always felt like George W. Bush can't articulate Jack. I I mean, I thought he did a great job after 9-11, and uh, he was an inspirational figure, and I like him as a dude. But I never felt like he was a staunch conservative that could articulate those values and could hold his own in any type of intellectual sparring. I don't think he was a dumb guy. He was a double MBA. Um, And then you fast forward from him into John McCain. And I never thought John McCain was uh, good. (laughs) Just wasn't. And then what, we got Mitt Romney after that. And Mitt Romney was a nice guy. And and Mitt Romney could uh, speak intelligently, but he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't conservative, you know? He just, he wasn't. And certainly Donald Trump has not been um, an articulate individual. He's not been a staunch, so... I cannot think of, and you can go back to the vice presidential debates in all of those, whether it was Dick Cheney, eh, uninspiring. Like, even if he's saying good stuff, he, he can't, there's no passion behind it. There's no, so no on Dick Cheney, and then who do we get after that? Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan had a little bit um, of fire, but I just have never felt like, man, this was a good debate. This said in front of the American people, what the two different sides hold on to and and what they believe and what they're bringing to the country. I wish we had more of this. I've never felt that way after a debate until uh, the the Vance Walls debate. And by the way, I'm not saying that just because Vance won, because there's some things that I really disagree with J.D. Vance on. Um, I, I, I felt at times that we were talking or listening to two big government guys 
who are going to spend a lot of money that we don't have. It was just what they're going to spend it on and, and in what direction and how they're going to spend it. But for a small government person, you didn't really have a, a strong voice there. So it's not as though I'm saying, oh yeah, J.D. Vance was awesome because I think, man, I love what he's saying all the time. No, uh, I thought that it was a good debate. <laughs> and I thought this is the kind of stuff our country needs. So I got that and the humiliation of the media. Yahtzee. I just, I, it was great. It was great. Loved it. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on all of that. You can shoot it my way, peterpeterheck.com. That's peterpeterheck.com. Or you can comment below. Now listen, for those of you who are paid subscribers, a couple things that are coming up in the second half. And I would love it, those of you who are free subscribers, if you'd give us a shot. Just click the link and even do it for a month at $10 a month. It's a $10 commitment. And if you don't like what you're getting, you don't have to renew it. It's that simple. Just don't renew. I hope you do. Uh, or you can get the discount, 20 bucks off. Just do it for the whole year. Just do it for 100 bucks one time. Just like that. And you get us through the election and all of that stuff and, and into the new administration, whoever it's going to be. Because it's going to be new, uh, whichever it is. Um, but for those of you who are paid subscribers... Two things. What Melania Trump just did. Horrible. I don't know why in the world. I, it's just... Uh, uh, you want to talk about depressing and discouraging conservatives to come out and vote for your husband? My goodness. So what Melania Trump has been up to, which is just unbelievable, that comes up in the second half. And then, and I'm being completely serious, by the way, and then how I can tell you without, sh without a shadow of a doubt how you can know that J.D. Vance won this debate. Because you know me, and I've got more conservative politics, and J.D. Vance is clearly more conservative than Tin Walls. So it's it's biased, right? No. There is one surefire way to know that J.D. Vance won that debate. There is one obvious way to do it. It's like when people argue, and, and at the beginning of every year, school year, in my government classes, uh, government class, we, we talk about, is America the best country in the world? How do you measure what is a great country? Like, what's the criteria? And after we talk about this and we discuss it and we watch a couple things on it, uh, and they come up with their list of what their criteria, criteria would be, and everybody eventually decides, well, it's kind of subjective, you know? It depends on what kind of country you want. I say to them that there is one surefire, obvious, objective standard by which you can measure the greatness of a country. Do you know what that is? I'm even going to make you wait for that. I'm going to tell you what that is. The singular thing that will tell you the greatness of a country, and it's objective. It's an objective standard, not based on uh, subjective feelings or, you know, I think freedom's important, but I also think that morals are important. No, none of that. None of that. Um, the one objective standard. And I'll do the same thing. The one objective standard that tells me that J.D. Vance won that debate. Both of those things. Melania, I guess three now. Melania, the one thing that can tell you if you're a great country. And the one thing that you can know that tells you J.D. Vance won this debate. All of that comes up after the break for paid subscribers, free subscribers. I'll see you next week. The Memo with Peter Heck. Please patronize and thank all the sponsors of the Heck Podcast, including McGonagall's Buick GMC, Terrell's Auto Service, Norris Insurance, Stevens Machine, Creative Financial Center, Indiana Right to Life, Trigreen Tractor, The Indiana Family Institute, Hartman Family Farms, Liberty Financial Group, The Wyman Group, and J. Watson Creations.